Welcome to Microscope, a series of in-depth, critical, comprehensive, and informative conversations about issues that really matter in community. No scripts, no written questions, minimal or no editing. This is what journalism does best. Join me, Steve Betchkel, as we sit down and get down to the matter at hand. From your perspective, and you were to look at your life and prioritize who you are, where does writing fit into the list of how you identify yourself? Well, I'm really not so much a writer anymore. I'm a retired writer, although I guess I still do some writing. In fact, I was up last night writing a, a column for the paper about uh, a Green Fire, Wisconsin Green Fire, a group of uh, former Wisconsin DNR employees who formed to kind of advocate for science. So I do do a small amount of freelance writing, um, a few other things, but I'm mostly retired now, um, drawing Social Security, gray hair, you know. Okay, so let me clarify that. If, if you were to identify yourself, you'd identify yourself first as retired? <laughs> I think so. <laughs> and through my life, I, um, I, it wasn't my plan to be a writer, although I always enjoyed reading growing up, but um, I actually went to school and studied wildlife ecology, and I, in fact, I do have an undergraduate degree in wildlife, but... Um, as I was in school, I maybe got an inkling that I was never going to be the best biologist, and there weren't any jobs for that anyway. <laughs> and I had taken a, a journalism class, uh, actually an agricultural journal, journalism class, and I had enjoyed it. And so I did a double major with uh, the, the ecology part and egg journalism. And um, maybe it should have been a, a, a a red light to me that I tested out of all the English requirements when I went to college, but I uh, had tr struggled with the math requirements, so maybe I was meant to go in the writer direction anyways. But um, then I kind of bungled into the, uh, I, after school I, I did some short-term work with the uh, Forest Service and uh, I caught geese at Horicon Marsh for a while. I went into the Peace Corps in a program that's now extinct, but it was a uh, a cooperative effort with the U.S. Peace Corps and the Smithsonian Institute where they were sending people to do environmental things in, uh, in lands where the Peace Corps was working. So I, I had taken French and I uh, had gotten a D, but that didn't seem to matter to them. They sent me to, to Tunisia, which is an Arabic and French-speaking country. And um, uh, I was... I was sort of a biologist then. I think they wanted one writer in the group to to uh, write these park plans, which, which never really materialized. It, it never, as often happens in the Peace Corps, didn't turn out the way it's supposed to. Um, but, so that was my, one of my efforts at being a biologist and further convincing me that maybe that wasn't the direction I should go. When would so, this have been? What year are you talking about? Uh, late 70s, late 70s. I'm not quite sure of the exact year, but. So then I came, came back and went to grad school, and then I decided, well, maybe I better try to be some kind of writer. And I uh, went back to UW-Madison uh, studying uh, what they call the agricultural journal journalism natural science option, where instead of taking the classes that any proper journalist should take, you know, heavy on the pol political science, I took sci basically science classes. Cause that's, and I had a couple of jobs with the university writing about research you know, going on there. And I kind of, at that time, I kind of saw myself as maybe doing something with some federal agency or state agency. Um, what I ended up doing was a lot more fun than that, although maybe not as <laughs> financially rewarding. I, one day, I, towards the end of my uh, time there, um, I was walking down a stairwell and I saw a paper attached to the wall that said the Eau Claire Leader Telegram was looking for an outdoor writer. And I thought, well, I don't have a job. I'm about to graduate. I, I better get going. So I gave them a call and came up here. Um, writing for a newspaper it was never on my radar screen. But um, I turned out to be the, uh, the new outdoor writer here, kind of following the shoes of Dave Carlson. There was one person, Joan Bennett, between Dave and myself. So what year would that have been, you think? That would have been the year the Brewers were in the World Series. So was that 81? 81 or 82, something like that. And you saw that posting in Madison? Yeah, at UW-Madison, yeah. Um, so when we came um, with Bonnie, I, I was married by then, 
uh, almost, yeah, I, we were married by the time we came up here and we thought, well, we'll stay in Eau Claire a year or two and I'll get a little writing experience. Um, but 34 years later, <laughs> we're still here. Um, so did I, do I see myself as a writer? I guess I saw myself a little bit, maybe as a writer, but uh, more as a reporter. Um, the emphasis was not so much on the craft of writing necessarily as getting something out on deadline that would hopefully uh, be useful to people or maybe affect public policy. Although I did, as the outdoor writer, I, I wrote basically a column, which is, can be basically an editorial. I wrote one, a column once a week, so I guess I was um, uh, a bit of a writer in that sense and that I would try to craft an argument in uh, the time I had allotted. <laughs> which working for a uh, medium-sized weekly n daily newspaper was not a lot. To, well, I've to heard it play. described a writer, sometimes people say storyteller. You know, I, do you think of yourself as a storyteller? I do, I do, I guess. Um, at least the column part, yeah. You're, you're especially, well, often I would write the first person, you know, I would go fishing and describe it. You're trying to vicariously take the reader along with you, so you, um, and, it's good in a way because it makes you pay a little more attention to detail, you know, maybe what did you see a yellow warbler while you're trout fishing, you know, where there's some caddisflies hatching. Um, so in that case, you really were telling a story. Um, I don't know if any columns I wrote were great art or <laughs> changed people's lives, but it was a way to, it's kind of a point in time, take you out, you know, it's, it's May now in Wisconsin, we're going out, the caddisflies are hatching on a local trout stream, we're going out and, and try to catch a trout. and. Uh, and through the device of having a column, always some of your own biases, a lot of your own biases spill out. So every column in a way is a mini editorial. And also this is a good way to spend my time. I'm not home, I'm not golfing, I'm not home watching uh, old movies, although I do that often enough. So. <laughs> well, the, the getting out section is you know, an institution in itself. Uh, you know, I don't know if a lot of papers actually have a dedicated page to the outdoors. And, you know, every Friday, the back side, there's that getting out section. It is an institution that people really do see as a fixture in our area. And so you, you know that if you turn to that back page on a Friday, you're going to see some articles about the outdoors or you know, something about getting out and enjoying wildlife, recreation. Uh, and so people could look at that and depend upon that. And I think that that's something that people did look forward to. Well, hopefully. Um, I won't say that I pioneered that. I, it actually, I think Don Johnson, who is in the, uh, he's a nationally recognized uh, outdoor writer from Eau Claire. He went on to uh, Milwaukee Sentinel, where he um, did some pretty heavy reporting on things like the, the lead shot band and waterfowl and, and, and did, took a science-based approach to that issue. Um, and I think Wisconsin also takes credit with a whole bunch of local bias to having the first outdoor writer, which was Gordon McQuarrie, who um, grew up in Superior and was the editor for the Superior Daily Paper and then went down to the Milwaukee Journal and was the first editor uh, for the Milwaukee Journal. And um, that was kind of how I became exposed to outdoor activities because my family was not a, uh, was not an outdoor family. We didn't camp or fish or hunt. <laughs> And but we brought uh, Jay Reed and uh, and others uh, outdoor writers into our home on Sundays, and uh, so it was for a while kind of an institution with most um, medium-sized Wisconsin paper to have an outdoor page, and that's shrinking now as, as newspapers fade. <laughs> the outdoor page is is one of the first things to go. I mean, if you look at uh, just Western Wisconsin, La Crosse used to have a full-time outdoor writer. Um, he was a little different situ situation. Most typically, the outdoor page is, is on the sports page. Um, we were, you know, the Leader Telegram was a little different in that it was in the city, city pages. Um, so I, I answered to the city editor, not to the sports editor, which I think was overall better if you want to write about, if you just want to write about fishing and telling people how to catch a big bass, sports page is okay if you want to write about the little bit about environmental politics or the politics of uh, resources um, might be better to be on the city desk. And I should say too that I was never a full-time outdoor writer. I always had uh, um, general reporting duties and uh, 
when the newspaper was at its height of circulation while I was here, those general reporting duties usually inv involve something with an environmental angle. We're working on a weekend story. Um, as we shrank, it became more and more uh, of a, um, uh, just general reporting anything. I mean, one of my most famous uh, weekend stories was on a, a, a bridal, uh, bridal workshop or a bridal gown <laughs> workshop here. I was the weekend reporter, and the editors decided that was the, uh, the big event in town that weekend. Bridal show, I guess it was called. So they sent me out there, and, and I got ribbed a lot after that for being the outdoor writer, uh, writing about wedding dresses. But all I remember is that strapless gowns were, were in vogue that year. So, so peop, your identity, whether you recognize yourself as a writer, your identity here, I mean, you say Joe Knight, and people think, you know, the outdoors writer guy, the getting mm -hmm. out guy, and that's what, that's what your identity is. Are you comfortable with that? Are you pleased with that? If you look back at your 30-some years writing for the newspaper, you, are, you, are you content? with that idea that people think of Joe Knight as the, you know. Yeah, yeah, I guess I'm, I'm happy being, I guess the distinction with writer is I'm not rewriting my columns four times, you know, to get just right, the right adverb or, you know, just the right flow to it, because that was, in fact, I'm kind of late. I, one thing about so much deadline writing, is it made me almost lazy, because I <laughs> just pound it out, hand it off to an editor and copy editor and say, hope you guys can fix this. <laughs> Deadlines can do that to a person. Mm -hmm. But I, I, I guess as far as being the edit, the outdoor guy, um, uh, yeah, I thought that was a great, great opportunity. Um, I was, you know, I, I, sometimes it would surprise you. You'd go, I'd go to like a, a funeral, and here would be some yellowed column I had written about the person that I had long forgot about, but it obviously made a, it, um, it, some kind of impression in that person's life and the life of the family. So. Um, and it gave me a, a chance to inflict my viewpoints on uh, environmental policy issues on the unsuspecting public. So, uh, yeah, I well, guess it doesn't hurt me. Despite yeah. what people say, every journalist goes into a story with some perspective, whether you call that a bias or a personal perspective, it, uh, it doesn't really matter. It's a semantic thing. But you, you write with what, where you are and, and where, where you think, where, where you um, sit at the moment, and you try to be truthful and fair, but you always have a perspective. This morning I saw in the Leader Telegram that Kathy Stepp has, been, has taken a job at the EPA. And you, over those 30 years, saw a lot of Wisconsin conservation history and environmental history go by. I'd like to know, I'd like to start in a kind of an investigation, examination of what you saw over those years and, and what you remember and some of the highlights of your career. And let's talk about, first let's start with though, some of your favorite stories, some of your favorite um, writing coverage um, opportunities, the things you got to do and, and write about that you really recall and remember as, as favorite. I guess a particular favorite doesn't stand out. They would be, uh, I guess one thing was you, you got to kind of uh, insert yourselves into people's lives and call someone up and say, hey, <laughs> I'm the outdoor writer at the local paper, we should go fishing. <laughs> and often they, they would take me out. And um, through the years, I did, there were people who I would go to, especially as my time got more and more uh, constricted with more, uh, more general reporting. I often relied on, on uh, some, I considered them my mentors. I could, who can you call up on a Tuesday afternoon and say, hey, I have uh, four hours to go fishing, for, and I need an outdoor column this week. Can we go out? And they'd say, sure, sure, yeah. Bluegills are biting up on Marshmallow Lake. So um, one friend who uh, kind of taught me about bluegills uh, was Ed Solon, who um, was a Department of Transportation uh, worker when I first met him, uh, long since retired now. But um, when I came here, I was, uh, I was too snooty to fish for bluegills very much. They lived in green lakes with too much algae, you know, and I, was, I wanted clear rivers with trout or at least smallmouth bass. And he took me up on the Marshmallow Lake and um, it was in the evening and the sun was setting and uh, uh, midges were hatching all over and the bluegills were rising and there was a host of birds. Um, they had purple martins up there, one of the few places I've ever seen them. Um, you know, uh, night hawks cruising at, at dusk and three or four different kinds of swallows. And uh, um, 
I still remember those nights, and we still try to get out, although he's, he, has, he has vision problems now, so he kind of fishes by, by, uh, by Zen, I think. He can somehow cast a popper out and still know when a, when a bluegill has taken it. Um, but other people, like Clarence Wilson was a, um, another uh, um, highway engineer kind of guy, who also long since retired, who taught me about fly fishing and took me out uh, uh, in a canoe down the Brule, fishing for trout or on local streams, um, fishing for, for trout or different people who helped me train the dog. Um, so really, I guess when I look back, the things that don't come to mind are uh, some some column I wrote on an environmental issue. The, the people come to mind and the chance to, to meet people and to maybe share <laughs> with, with whatever readership there was um, some of the ideas of, of different people in, in sort of in the circulation area. You, you took, a, didn't you take a fishing trip every year with a certain group of people too? Oh, for many years it, it was kind of a, a father and son trip except for a, me and Bill Nielsen, who was the city, actually the uh, city council president at the time. So he kept telling me, keep, keep, keep a low profile because uh, I want people to think I'm home doing the city bu business, not up in Canada, you know, fishing for walleyes and portaging in canoes. Uh, of course I didn't, I always wrote it, but yeah, there were six of us and we'd always go the, uh, the last week uh, before uh, Labor Day week. In fact, we'd go this week. And we'd always, as we drove north on 53, we'd always meet the Nighthawks coming back and uh, um, going south, uh, but that was a nice time to be be in the uh, in Canada. The uh, black flies and the mosquitoes weren't so ferocious. Um, they were mostly done. The days were a little shorter, so we often ended up having dinner by a gas lantern. But uh, nights were cool and good for sleeping. And, uh, Did you always go to the same place? Or different we places? always went to a different place. I think twice we went to Quetico, but that was a little too crowded for our taste. And uh, so where do Oh, I'm trying to think of some of the places we went. We went out of uh, out of Pickle Lake a couple times. Uh, um, different, uh, yeah, I'm drawing a blank on where we went, but we went from uh, oh, the Lake Nipigon area north to uh, all the way over to the border by uh, what's, what's bordering Ontario. Um, can't even think of drawing a blank on that too. But one thing about being an old outdoor writer, your uh, your memory's starting to go. Too many Woodland Caribou Park, we did. That was probably the fur furthest west we got. But mostly in Canada. Most almost all in Canada. Yeah, yeah. So, that that we did that for many years, and that kind of petered out as the members grew and ha started having kids and okay. wanting to take their kids kids on canoe trips of their own, and uh, all of us getting a little bit more frail, I guess. So you've met a lot of people, to, to say the least, uh, uh, over this time in different venues, um, fishing, and hunting, other outdoor recreations. Do you know how many articles you wrote for the Leader Telegram? Do you have an idea how many total you might have written? I don't. I don't know if I want to know the number. I guess you could Google per year and, and get, get a number, but um, yeah, well, consider uh, what, writing three or four or five or more stories a week for uh, 34 years. Yeah, it's a lot. <laughs> yeah. It gets up to, yeah, no. I had written it so, so long I was, uh, sometimes I go to the morgue before everything was electronic and pull out a story and start reading and say, who is the idiot who wrote this, you know, and then look and read my own bylines. So, <laughs> so yes, uh, you did a lot of stories about people and what they did, but you also did stories about policy. You would talk about um, your perspective again, uh, what the DNR might be up to, uh, regulations in Wisconsin. Uh, when you started in 82 and finished in what, 2014, 15? Probably 15 or 15, 16. 16? Probably 15. Yeah, a lot has, lot has changed. And, and what, give me an idea, your perspective over those years, uh, what you think about. Wisconsin, the, play, the birthplace uh, or the home of Gaylord Nelson and uh, Aldo Leopold. How are we doing as a state from your perspective? <laughs> um, <coughs> Wisconsin is still, still a beautiful place to live um, with lots of uh, resources, especially if you like doing things outside. But um, yeah, from a policy perspective, we're, uh, <coughs> we're in a steep decline. <laughs> in fact, the, uh, the downward spiral, spiral kind of parallels my uh, 
journalism career, so I, I don't know if I can take full responsibility, but uh, in the mid-90s, I think uh, Wisconsin was the leader in uh, uh, natural resources, both in research for things like muskies and deer, um, and for the environmental part, we were the first, uh, first state to have uh, sulfur dioxide emissions. In fact, we led that, the nation later followed. Um, and now we're, uh, <laughs> we've got a political appointees uh, running the DNR, one who just recently departed, as you mentioned when we began talking. Um, yeah, it's, it's been, uh, we used to have science-based um, uh, science based decision making. Now we have, um, the, uh, science, scientists are not even asked to testify at the hearings. There's basically a gag order on DNR staff. We just had a hearing on uh, weakening the baiting rules um, for deer, which uh, had been imposed as a way of uh, control, trying to prevent the, the, the rapid spread of chronic wasting disease. And no DNR biologist spoke at that hearing. Mm. We just had a hearing about uh, assembly and environment committee hearing about um, restricting warden access to private land. Um, a lot of retired wardens testified at that during the public comment period, but no staff wardens or warden supervisors were invited to come before the committee and field questions. So, um, yeah, we're basically turned our back on science. We've had a purge of uh, scientists from the DNR. Um, in many cases, these were not people who were uh, being funded through, uh, through our state income taxes or through hunting and fishing fees. These are people who um, had federal sources of funding, but they were considered not part of the core, core DNR mission, to use a, a term the governor and, and other legislators used. Um, we had DNR go in after the fact and change language on climate change and human human contributions to uh, greenhouse emissions and climate change. So, yeah, we're in we're in a severe case of uh, of climate denial now. And um, if I look back, it it probably began in the mid '90s when um, under Governor Thompson, um, who now he looks like not maybe not such a bad environmental governor when we saw what was to follow but um, the language was changed in the state budget that uh, we've always had a, or for since the 60s we've had a, uh, a citizens group setting environmental policy and they were independent and they were appointed to staggered terms by different governors the, they had six-year terms so they if it was a one-term governor they would outlast the governor and um, it was their job to hire the DNR secretary, and the DNR secretary was all, almost always, uh, Tony Earle might have been an exception, but was a career biologist, a, a later career or resource person. George, George Meyer was a the head warden there. Um, Buzz Besadney came from a wildlife background, but they were always someone who had spent the career, their career in some aspect of resources management or enforcement. And they really had no aspirations beyond that. They didn't want to go on. Again, maybe the exception was Tony Earle, who became a governor for four years. And he, he did kind of use the secretary position as a jumping, jumping off <laughs> point for the, uh, for the governorship. But um, that has changed. Um, w that the um, resource secretary is now appointed by the governor. And initially, I didn't think it made a big difference, but as we've progressed through different governors, it's gotten worse and worse till uh, um, under Jim Doyle, we saw the secretary fired, who had been a friend of his, um, fired apparently because he was uh, enforcing or wanting to enforce the Clean Air Act uh, on a big coal plant in downtown Madison. And uh, under Governor Walker, it's, uh, the top positions have been completely stacked with people who had not, no professional background or uh, educational background in resource management. They were political appointees in the uh, worst sense of the term. So, and we've got the kind of decisions you might, you might expect with those people. I mean, uh, environmental enforcement is down. Um, yeah. We've talked, uh, there's a... Um the term you hear all the time, resource management. And in Wisconsin here, uh, we're very proud of our resources. We, we like the idea that there are forests to wander and we like the idea there are clean trout streams. And we've kind of worked hard to get that and to preserve it. Do you think that those are under threat at this time, the, the quality of those resources? 
I guess it depends on the case. I think we still have uh, uh, very clean water. In fact, in this part of the state, in western and southwestern Wisconsin, um, the water is getting cleaner in most cases than these small streams as uh, land use practices. That mostly has to do with what the farmers are doing on the land. And um, every, every few years when DNR biologists go out and survey streams, they're finding like brook trout and brown trout in the streams that previously uh, didn't, didn't have them. And those are kind of, well, the species I like to fish for, for one thing, but they're also indicators of pretty good water quality. So um, at the landscape level, in some places, the, uh, I'd, I'd say we're actually gaining ground. Um, there's been backsliding with, uh, with the uh, lower enrollments in conservation reserve program. That's a federal program that encourages landowners to keep their land and especially erodible land in, in grass or permanent cover. Um, one other factor that <laughs> is kind of beyond control at the state level is um, we're getting more intense uh, rainstorms. Well, as, we, as we speak now, the, the big news is the flooding of Houston. Um, we've seen that at a, m a much minor, more a lower, smaller scale in western Wisconsin. We've had a couple of what we used to consider 100-year floods. I think we had one last year, and we had one this year, and we had one 10 years ago that actually was responsible for some people died during that one. So um, I guess while we're making progress in land uses, perhaps we're facing uh, more intense rainstorms that um, cause, uh, cause, cause more erosion. Let me uh, adjust this camera quick. I will take a little cut. Uh, I'm going to zoom in. Can't really in. answer your question. Well, I'm going to pursue that 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 answer a little bit and talk about climate change. We uh, have a, a state that is, like you said, in a state of denial. It's a, it's you can't talk about human caused climate change. That's too political. But at the same time, what that means is that under this administration, we may not be addressing climate change in a realistic or or assertive manner. And so what is happening now could be that the unenforcement that we're doing now could lead to bigger problems later. We're talking about water resources, we're talking about uh, wildlife, we're talking about changes in, in uh, forest structure, and there's always uh, issues with forest management. But do you think that this is um, smart management to, to ignore these things? If we're looking at the future, you said the waters clean because we like clean water. We learned that mm -hmm. in Wisconsin that we like to have clean water. We don't want our rivers catching on fire. Uh, we like clean air and that's a good thing. And, and the people of Wisconsin could be a little bit sleepy on this issue though. We worked hard to get to this point. If we let it go for a few years, an uh, administration or two, um, it could backslide very seriously and we could be losing some of these treasured resources. For, yeah, for, for climate change, I, don't, I think that's going to be very gradual, and uh, I, th I think we're accelerating it. It might have happened anyways. Um, uh, selfishly, during my life span, it's not, it's not, it's not going to probably, I'm, I guess we're seeing some, some subtle changes now, maybe with increased flooding. It's hard to know what percentage of that to attribute to uh, um, carbon emissions. but. Um, it's, it's just more of a moral thing that, that, you know, we should be paying it forward. We, the resources we enjoy now, the large amount of public land we enjoy now in, in Wisconsin was because of the foresight of uh, people that went before us. And we're, we're not, uh, we're not uh, behaving ethic ethically, I think, when we deny what the vast majority of science, scientists say is going on. Um, yeah, as far as, um, I didn't really answer your, your earlier question about changes over time. Um, well, the, the Clean Water Act was a, uh, in the early 70s was a uh, um, prime example of, uh, it was initially the paper companies didn't like it. It said they'd put them out of business. Um, it turned out we now have tubers tubing down, you know, in the hot summer days, tubing down the Chippewa River in the middle of Eau Claire. Um, uh, paper companies survive. We still have toilet paper. Um, globalization has actually been harder on Wisconsin paper companies than the Clean Act, Air Act was. But at the time, too, we had a, a very aggressive DNR that was allowed to uh, to uh, um, implement the the changes re 
you know, called for on the Clean Water Act. So um, that's been one of the major things. Clean Air Act, same thing. Um, major environmental things that were passed really the 1970s were in the environmental decade. And um, all that, those major laws came during then. Um, Endangered Species Act, maybe a little earlier than that. But uh, yeah, so now we have kind of gone like this. Now we're at the other end of the bell curve in our policy making at least. And so, um, are you concerned for the next generation that, you know, okay, we have worked so hard to get here uh, if we are not safeguarding those things, if we're ignoring issues, if we're not actively promoting policy to look at the future. I mean, okay, this isn't Key West. This isn't Houston where we're going to get that kind of catastrophe. So maybe we're saying it ain't going to happen here. You know, but like you said, subtly, we could have issues with um, species being pushed out of Wisconsin because of habitat change, a uh, more arid climate. Uh, we could have um, different weather systems that would make it harder for us to, uh, to have the same kind of Wisconsin we do now. Um, do you think then that we should be doing it differently and how differently and what should we be doing? Well, um, first thing we could stop denying <laughs> that climate change is taking place. Um, I guess there's things as individuals we can do, like I drive a hybrid, we have solar panels up here. Um, does that make a difference in the big picture? Probably not. Very, in, very tiny incremental difference, but uh, it makes me sleep a little better at night. Um, but we need, it, we should have policy that encourages alternative energy, um, uh, more efficient transportation. Um, and often it turns out that that makes it economic sense after all, um, in the long run. Um, yeah, among the things we're going to be lost, we're going to be losing. They've done pro projections 50 years from now, and we'll probably lose a lot of our brook trout. Um, uh, uh, rough grouse, these are two of my favorite species that, <laughs> to chase. They're going to be pushed north and maybe out of the state uh, over, over the next 50 years. I don't, that won't affect me personally, probably, uh, given my age, but um, yeah, that, that'll be a sad, sad event. So if the water temperatures in a, in a brook trout, trout stream increase a few degrees, it wouldn't be good for brook trout anymore. They'd like a little cooler? They like it cooler, yeah. It'll uh, there'll be a transition. Um, probably more brook trout streams will go to uh, smallmouth bass streams. Um, selfishly, one thing we've seen with <laughs> I think it's related to global warming is we have the best smallmouth bass fishing we've ever had, and this is a, a cool water species, but it, it has benefited from slightly warmer spring temperatures, I think, and and we have um, more bass with bigger growth rates in our streams, so. Um, I guess everything about climate change isn't isn't bad, but um, yeah, I guess I'm, I'm worried about it. I think everyone should be worried. If we look at uh, other, let's take uh, uh, birds are a good example. I mean, we worked hard to get eagles back. This is one of the best places in the world to see bald eagles, bluebirds. Uh, we, we worked hard to get those back, and that was not an accidental thing. We actually were proactive by using uh, environmental protection. Uh, we were we were reducing uh, toxins in our environment. We were actively doing things to keep these uh, to bring these birds back from the edge of extinction. I mean, right now, um, you know, we have Kirtland's warblers in Wisconsin, and we're trying to raise up whooping cranes. These are things that need a really proactive management. And so, uh, I guess you know, science is still there for that, isn't it? I mean, we're, we're still working towards keeping those things going. In the yeah, yeah. One, one thing we could say is we solve some of the easier problems. I mean, once we figured out what DDT is in our current environmental atmosphere, we probably wouldn't get DDT banned. But once there was the proof that it was uh, thinning the eggshells of a, a number of birds, um, we acted on that and uh, we had tremendous results, you know. Um, same with bluebirds, you know, we, we became, well, they probably were artificially high because people put up wooden fence posts. And then we lo just about lost them, and then we started putting out bluebird boxes. Um, some of the issues we're dealing now are, are a little more difficult. Oh, clean water still tail, you know, um, piping emissions at the point of, of a, a pipe coming out of a factory. Um, that's a little easier to regulate. Now we're dealing with non, probably our, our biggest water pollution pro issue is non-point source. And that's a little bit of phosphorus coming from a bunch of different yeah. sites, a bunch of different landowners 
climate change, the same thing. Um, can we change our behavior, uh, you know, and drive smaller cars or not drive as much, um, use more alternative energy? That's things that, that we can do. Um, I think the, the first the first step in that is convincing everybody there's a problem. You know, it, it's an ethical issue we should be dealing with. One of the things that you've seen over this time is this age of mining. Uh, there's been a, I could say, a resurgence in mining in Wisconsin. Uh, you've witnessed this uh, change over the years. We've had uh, uh, minerals, we have frac sand. What's your perspective on this evolution, on this process of mining as a, as a writer in the getting out section uh, over those 30 years? What, do you, what have you seen happen there? Well, we've, Wisconsin has had some uh, tough laws on mine, on hard rock mining, that frax, getting, taking up sand is a different issue, but um, um, I remember uh, oh, 20 years ago or more, um, uh, there was going to be a big mine built near Crandon in northeastern Wisconsin, and um, there was a lot of concern about that because it, it was in a, a mineral deposit that had uh, a lot of sulfur there and uh, the track record for mining and, and sulfur deposits has been pretty dismal and there was general concern around the state and uh, I know as a trout fisherman again my, my sportsman's bias always comes in it would, would have been in the headwaters of one of the most beautiful rivers in the state the, the Wolf River which is a uh, maybe the best whitewater most spectacular uh, whitewater uh, stream in the state. It was also a trout stream, some temperature problems, but pretty spectacular trout stream. Um, and that was threatened somewhat by this mine if, if the worst case scenario with acid emissions and heavy metal emissions took place. Um, and the state, in reaction to that, the state adopted in a bipartisan fashion um, pretty uh, serious mining rules. Um, and those rules are threatened actually to be, to, with being rolled back right now. Uh, Senator Tom Tiffany in, in Northern Wisconsin has introduced some mining regulations that would severely weaken a lot of those, uh, those rules. Um, uh, one, one of the major rules in that was at the time people were worried, well, is it possible to mine in sulfide deposits? And the, the law adopted was sometimes called the show me law. Um, before you could mine in a sulfide deposit in Wisconsin, you would have to show, find an example of uh, where sulfide mining had taken place and the mine had been safely closed for 10 years or more. That's still on the books, but it may be about to be rolled back. <laughs> and um, another provision was that often in the Western mines, they'd cause horrible pollution and then the mine company would move on and leaving the public to, or anyone else to pick up the tab for the cleanup. So there was perpetual responsibility law passed in Wisconsin. That may be about to be rolled back too. <laughs> we'll, we'll see where this, uh, where Tiffany's bill goes. But um, it was interesting, I, I, this has been a heavy mail issue lately. I, I seem to be getting mail, getting, get mails from a number of conservation environmental groups and Sierra Club sent something out. I'll just, if I can use a prop here, my one prop I brought along. Um, in the original mining bill um, passed in uh, 1998, um, it was a uh, bipartisan state assembly vote was 91 to six. And among those people um, were Sheila Harsdorf, then a, then a uh, assembly member, um, Scott Walker, <laughs> then an assembly men member from the Milwaukee area. Among the senators voting in, in favor of it was Dave Zine, not, not known as an environmental crusader. So mm -hmm. now, sadly, I understand that the, uh, Terry Moulton, who now has Dave Zine's state senate seat, is uh, signed on as a co-sponsor to this. Um, this is a guy who is an excellent muskie fisherman who's, whose family business is uh, designing and selling muskie lures to some extent. So um, I guess that when we're looking at the uh, where the direction the state is going over the last 20 years or more. Um, that could be Exhibit A, that just that vote. Now it appears to be all along party lines. Um, environmental protection used to be a bipartisan concern. Yeah, both uh, Moulton and Petrick are, uh, are part of the legislative body that is not interested in uh, discussing climate change at this point. Uh, it, it's, it's something that's 
by policy uh, Republican legislators do not want to talk about. So the Flambeau mine, when it was built, it was the copper ore mine, and that's been long finished, covered up. It's been pretty clean. Uh, people were very concerned. They were very careful when they did the mine. There, was pro there were protests about it. But the mine followed those regulations, and the river right next to it, the Flambeau River right next to it, is still pretty clean. So, so what we found, though, what I'm getting at is that because Wisconsin has been tough on mines, and there has been regulation in place, it hasn't been like the old west where they got to move on and leave a mess behind and the rivers were all polluted. So it can be argued that because we were careful, because there were laws in the books, the, the Flambeau River is still pretty clean. Yeah, that, I think we're about to see that come back into the public discussion, the Flambeau mine, with uh, some environmentalists arguing that it did cause pollution. And some, and uh, in fact, uh, Tiffany may actually, I, I don't know if this is a for sure thing, but may actually hold a hearing at the Flambeau mine site to say this is this is a case where uh, you know there was mining a sulfide deposit, um, and it it is clean. Um, there's a couple asterisks I put along. The environmentalists are saying apparently there are trace amounts of or small amounts of heavy metals uh, in, coming into the Flambeau from an intermittent stream. My impression is, as you said, that it's a healthy river. Um, if you go up there. It has a thriving uh, crayfish population. I've never, never seen more crayfish, you know. And uh, as you might expect with a lot of crayfish, you have some very fat and happy smallmouth bass. And so my impression is that it, it's a healthy river, in, in the, at least in the layman sense. There may be from time to time small amounts of uh, heavy metals, but I would, I would call uh, the Flambeau mine a, a success story. Um, the original proposal for the mine, if you look on the DNR website, was quite a bit different. They were going to be uh, open pit mining, I think it was for 11 years, and then um, doing more, more uh, traditional underground kind of mining for another long period. Um, and that the ore was going to be processed on the site. What they ended up doing was just taking the highest grade ore and shipping it by rail north into Canada where it was refined. And refining is part of the most problematic uh, phases of uh, mining sulfur, you know, or in a sulfur deposit. So I guess both, both sides can, can make a case there, but um, I, I think it, w it could be a case saying that yes, Wisconsin's uh, mining restrictions worked and um, Lady Smith has a library out of the deal. They have a tall grass prairie there. Um, there were some buildings that were repurposed. I think DNR is using one of the buildings that Flambeau Mining originally used. So, um, I, I thought that was a reasonably good outcome for, for a modern mine. Do you think that over the time of your writing that what you wrote mattered to people? Did it, did it make people more environmentally conscious? That's hard for me to judge. Sometimes I would get people calling up and complaining about what I wrote and sometimes I would get people calling up with uh, saying, oh, we, oh yeah, I just wrote something um, now about um, there was an eruption of, of giant swallowtail butterflies in western Wisconsin this summer. Um, the last one was like in 2008, uh, and um, I wrote a column on that just because I was seeing them around and uh, kind of wondering what they were. And um, I got a lot of feedback on that. Hey, I'm recognizing these two. You know, it's not a heavy environmental thing, but it's a, kind of a quality of life thing. Um, so that was kind of a fun thing. Um, as far as making a deep impression on people's lives, I'll, I'll probably never know that, <laughs> you know, one way or the other. It's interesting. I noticed that in, in the 80s when Ronald Reagan was president, he, he was very, very interested in um, dismantling some of the safeguards um, that were, he wasn't high on national parks. Uh, he wasn't high on the EPA at that time. He appointed the Secretary of the Interior that really had some radical views at that time. And there was a there was a strong public backlash. Keep your hands off our parks. We love our environment. We, 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 and, and America has come in that direction, has, has gone in that direction. We really do like our forests. We like our parks. We, as I said, we like our streams clean. And we like our air breathable. Those are important things. And, and, and so 
as you write about these things, not only do people read that and, and share in those sensations of, you know, wow, yeah, I, I fished there. Yes, I saw those butterflies. But there is a value there, a value clarification in Wisconsin that we celebrate those things. And so writing about them does that. It celebrates them. And it reinforces that with people that what you've got is a good thing. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, privatization, Reagan called it, I guess. And there was a public backlash. And there were, uh, there was recently, um, there have been, and are continuing to be, uh, 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 proposal floated to to sell off a lot of the western states would like to have federal land <laughs> would like to have the government turn over and sell them federal land in some cases like utah these are states who once had much more public land and chose to so, sell it off too and there has been a backlash against it uh, just as there was in the reagan years and that has been effective so um Oh, well, I, I sound a little gloom and doom now talking about the direction we're going at the federal level um uh, sportsmen's groups and environmental groups kind of got together. They don't always see it eye to eye, but um, spoke in favor of public land. Um, at state level, we're not doing so well. We have, we have a legislature that really doesn't like public land. Um, the stewardship program, our, our state program for acquiring uh, public land um, <clears throat> has been severely cut. And uh, in fact, the legislature ordered the DNR to, to sell off a fair amount of public land. I forget the exact figure, but um, interestingly, they didn't do a study and decide we have this much excess land. They picked an arbitrary figure and said, DNR, go find, find this land that we don't need anymore and sell it off. And DNR went through a, a, a process of evaluating different land and offered it for sale. Not all of it was sold off. And in some cases, it was told to counties, so it's still protected. But kind of shows you the, uh, where the, where the uh, legislature is coming from. I love the stewardship program as a person who gets outside, who enjoys public spaces, who likes to get out in the woods or, or walk uh, trails. I thought it was fantastic. We were in adding to that heritage. We were adding to place in Wisconsin that would not go under the bulldozer and that we knew uh, um, would be preserved forever. Um, uh, and there, we were able to preserve some really outstanding parcels like uh, Chippewa flowage, turtle flambeau flowage. Um, very recently, the um, uh, XL property, uh, NSP property down on the lower Chippewa River, um, prairies there, a variety of unique communities, and uh, that took about everything that was in the kitty for, mm -hmm. <laughs> for stewardship, the depleted stewardship program. But um, yeah, we've been able to preserve forever some, some jewels and even and some smaller it's made some important smaller uh, smaller uh, adaptations or, or progress too, like the bike trails, uh, the chalet out at uh, Tower Ridge Ski Area was paid for half by stewardship program. So it's been a it's been a good program, and it's made because it often will will require a 50% local match. It's made um, local clubs and governments also, um, uh, I think, have more ownership and in uh, some some of these things and, and have recreational outdoor developments that they, that they otherwise would not have had. Do you think it's the end of that green age where we took care of things, where we invested in the state, in our resources? Do you think people don't care? I would hope, I, I think we may be at a low ebb right now, but I think these things may come up and down. I'm hoping uh, maybe the 70s were a high, high point and now we're about to, to we're kind of bottoming it out I hope and <laughs> and we'll have a, we'll have a different uh, direction but um, I can't say I don't know um, the election for governor will be interesting. Um, Wisconsin has very always been very schizophrenic. I mean, we've got Senator Joe McCarthy and, and Bob LaFollette from the same state. So uh, I guess I wouldn't would never try to predict what Wisconsin voters will do. I think we still do as a state, especially people in the north of Milwaukee have, well, that's not fair. I'd say Milwaukee people too, they always, every weekend, there's a long train of people from Milwaukee going up north to camp and go to resorts. I think part of our identity has been the outdoor resources we have, hunting, fishing, um, more uh, biking, more maybe going a little bit more in the uh, uh, non-consumptive direction as the population grows. So. 
All right, well, whether you identify yourself as a writer or not, you have for 30 years invested words into your, your work. And so what would be your advice? I mean, you're not writing the column regularly. You still contribute. But if you were to talk to the people of Wisconsin that are out there enjoying it, that are out there getting out, what would you say to them? I would say, first of all, to get out, to get out and enjoy the resources. Um, whatever, uh, if you like to fish, we have great fishing. Um, if you like to bike ride, um, uh, that's that's kind of a well kept secret. I think Wisconsin has uh, fantastic bike riding uh, touring. Um, people from Twin Cities, if if they hold an organized bike ride in Eau Claire, half of the people will be from the Twin Cities because we have uh, rolling hills and lightly traveled roads and. Uh, we have partly the, the dairy industry to thank for that, um, that we have pa paved roads going from farm to farm. Um, so get out and enjoy it. Um, pay a little bit of attention to what's going on in the news and uh, doesn't hurt to, if you feel strongly about an issue to contact your legislator or write a letter to the editor. Um, I guess, guess that's it, but mostly just to get out and enjoy it. Anything else you want to add on your experience working uh, in the, in the, in the arena of outdoors recreation? Um, I, I think I was lucky to have the job I had. The pay wasn't that good, but it, uh, both from a, a human social perspective, meeting the different people I met, and from a, a chance maybe to contribute to uh, uh, environmental policy or at least weigh in. Be, um, I think I was fortunate that way. So. Um, one thing that's kind of sad is that uh, newspapers, as they decline, one of the first things they shed is their outdoor page. Um, and we're seeing that too, uh, Dave Carlson's program. Um, your, your program, you used to do some, some features on uh, environmental things. Well, you're gone now. <laughs> um, so I, I guess we're still struggling for uh, how are we going to get the message out in the future? You know, Is it going to be online? Um, but we, I think that's one of the challenges facing us right now. Yeah. I think uh, being an, an environmentalist and a journalist, that's, an, that's a threatened species right now. <laughs> well, anyways, thank you, Joe, for, for speaking with me. I appreciate it. No, it's been fun. Thank you for joining us today for Microscope. We've got more on many great topics. Look for us online at www.cvctv.org.